I love to preach. That's part of a pastor's job and uh, what he's called to do. So we'll do that today. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. What a great place to start, isn't it? And that kind of a new beginning and a, a new way. So Acts is a glorious place to start there. Acts chapter 1. Uh, let's go ahead and stand, if you would, out, out of respect for God's Word. We'll read verses 8 through 14. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, literally martyrs. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem for, uh, from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, the son of James. And listen to verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Let's pray. Our God, we are truly overwhelmed at who you are. Lord, when we begin to see in your word how your word describes you, we're, we can't even contain it. We can't grasp your greatness. And the more we see that, Lord, the more we are driven to worship you because you are worthy of that. You are a mighty God. You are holy. And we worship you, Lord. We also look into your word today, Lord, to proclaim the gospel. Not to contemplate it, but to proclaim it. To proclaim that Jesus is Lord. To proclaim our need for you. And to proclaim that our Lord Jesus has done everything needed to secure our salvation. To secure a relationship with with God the Father. So we thank you, God, for that. We thank you that you've given us this time separated that we can come and, and gather and hear your word and worship you, Lord. May we not take it lightly. May you do a great work among us today. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, last week as we read in verse 8, the church, the early church was given what I think is, I think the word, proper word is overwhelming task, an overwhelming task to take the gospel to the world, to take the good news about Jesus and his salvation to the world. From our perspective, not only to take it to Hampstead, but to take it to Pender County and North Carolina and the United States and ultimately to the world. That's what we are to do as a local body of believers. And I think you probably agree with me. From a human perspective, that is an overwhelming task. And I say this from the beginning that none of us in and of ourselves are able or capable of doing that. In our own strength, we could never accomplish that. We just could not. And we see that as we'll see throughout the entire book of Acts, with these disciples of Jesus, these followers of Jesus, before the Holy Spirit, before the promised Holy Spirit came, they strived, they tried, they worked, yet they were just failures ultimately. They could not do what they were called to do in and of their own strength. And that is true with us. And you think about it this way. We could not save ourselves... We can never have the strength or the goodness to save ourselves. So why on earth do we think we could live the Christian life by ourselves? In our own strength, we cannot do it. Hampstead Baptist Church cannot do what God has called it to do in our own strength. 
We cannot do it. And we clearly need to understand that. But that's not a bad thing. That's ultimately a good thing. Because if we could do it in and out of our own strength, we would get the glory for it and not God. But here's the great thing. We do not have to do it in our own strength. We do not have to strive under our own power in our own flesh to get the gospel to the world and glorify God that way. Because He has given us His Holy Spirit to do that for us. Through us. And I think you would agree today that we in America and the Christian church are living in unparalleled times in our country. We are facing things that we have never faced before in our country. And we will face things in the near future that will blow our minds. Things as far as persecution, as far as the world coming up against the church, as far as it being extremely difficult to be the church. We'll see those things. But it's a strange dichotomy because at the same time that it's the most difficult time to be a Christian and to be the church, it is also the greatest time to be the church. And I mean that, folks. You are blessed. We are blessed as a church to live in these days. Now, why do I say that? Morals are good for a society. Morals keep us from killing each other. Morals make a society run well. That's a good thing. We like morals, right? And morals naturally flow from a relationship with Christ. But sometimes they're legislated. Sometimes they are pushed upon people. And again, from a societal standpoint, that's not a bad thing because morals are good for a society. But sometimes morals mask the need for Jesus. Amen. Think about that. Back in the day in America, everybody looked the same. Everybody acted the same, mostly. And it was hard to tell sometimes the difference between the church and the world because we were told to do moral things. And as a society, basically America was a moral place. Mostly driven, I think, by, by the church and by salvation, but some just responded to that in other ways because of societal demands. But everybody looked the same. But in our day, that is not the case, is it? What are morals? Nobody even knows anymore in our world, in our society. So from that aspect, from a societal uh, uh, viewpoint, we're like, this is bad. Our world is falling apart. Our country is falling apart. But here's the good thing. There's a clear difference in the church and the world. Amen. You see, back in the day when everybody was moral, people were like, well, I don't need Jesus because the church is no different than I am. There's no difference. When you look at it, every, we look the same as them. We act the same as them. We don't drink, drink smoke, or chew, or whatever. You know, neither does the church, supposedly. And so we don't need this Jesus that they have. But now there's such a clear difference. Amen. So why do I say that? I say that because we can bombard the world, our country, with the gospel now. We can show them why they need it. It's clear and we can show them that. But we cannot do it in our own power. Hampstead Baptist Church is poised to continue to do some phenomenal things that will blow your socks off and bring great glory to God. We are there, folks. God has put everything there that we need, everything in place. You're, God has already done great things here and He's doing great things. And never lose track of that, by the way. I said Wednesday night, often we look to the future. We keep so focused on the future, we forget what God's doing now. And God has done great things here, and He's doing great things here among us. But He has called us to take the gospel to this community, to our state, to our country, and to the world. It's a great time to do it, but we cannot do it by ourselves. That's what we see happening in the early church, in Acts. They were frail, weak 
people that needed strength. And they tried to do it themselves, but they failed. So we realize that we cannot do it ourselves. But their world was clearly needing Jesus. And they needed help to do it. That's what we see. So here's my first thing, and this applies to us as Hampstead Baptist Church today. We as a church can rest in the promises of Jesus. Amen. We as believers, as a body of believers, listen, can rest in the promises of Jesus, of our Savior. Look again with me at verse 8. But you will receive power. You will receive dynamite. That's the word that, that in the original language, dunamis, where we get dynamite from. You will receive that kind of power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses throughout the entire world. You will be my witnesses. So think about this. This little band of believers... And Jesus was talking to them. They, they'd seen Him crucified. They'd seen Him die. They now see Him alive. And He promised them, I'm going away, but I will send the Comforter. I will send my Holy Spirit among you. And through that, you will have power. And through that, you will take the gospel to the entire world. Now, He was talking to people that didn't have Facebook or the Internet or telephones, or satellites, or anything like that. So for them to hear these words, it must have just flabbergasted them. We're going to take the gospel to the world? But it was coming from their Lord, who had promised He would defeat death and be raised again, and He did. So they were beginning to understand they could rest in His promises. And here's His first promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised them, church, here's my commission to you, and here's my promise to you, that I will send my Holy Spirit to you, and through Him, you can do all of these things. You can do these things. And they begin to rest in that. Now, we don't have time to do an extensive study of the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, how He does it, and all of that. Not this morning anyhow, but just briefly, here are some things that He does. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, indwells us as believers. Amen. Folks, honestly, I could stop right there today, and that would be enough for us to get the gospel to the world. The Holy Spirit of God indwells us as believers. And we sit around as if we have no power and can do nothing. We get worried when some political leader stands and says, we're going to get you Christians. Are you kidding me? The Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit gives us strength. When you are doing ministry and you think you cannot go another day, we've all been there, haven't we? I certainly have. Multiple times, many times. But He gives us the strength to persevere and to continue and to keep going. And there'll be days in the future, well, that will happen to you. You'll be so wiped out and so tired in whatever ministry you do. And you'll say, I just cannot continue. And somehow the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you will lift you up and give you strength, put you back on your feet, get you focused again, and get you out there again. It's what He does. There will be times when this church will just be so tired. For whatever reason, things may come against us. Or we may just be working extremely hard and doing ministry, and we'll be tired. But the Holy Spirit of God indwells us and He will give us strength. You don't have to do it yourself. He does it through us. Amen. And then the Holy Spirit gives us boldness. And I like this one. He gives us boldness. And folks, in the future, we're going to need this. Because there will be times, as we see in the book of Acts, where they came against the church. And they said, you stop it. Don't mention the word Jesus, the name Jesus. You can mention any other name, but not Jesus. You notice that, by the way? Any other name is okay, religiously speaking, 
But don't you dare mention the name Jesus. Why? Because when you mention his name, it drives people to their knees. Amen. That's who he is. And the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to speak his name. And we're gracious when we do it. We have a humble spirit when we do it. But we're bold. And we take the gospel to the world, boldly to the world, and say, there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved except through Jesus Christ. And he gives us boldness. And that's an incredible thing to see, isn't it? You think about this little band of believers who were weak, who were tired, who, who were mealy-mouthed at times. And the Holy Spirit came and indwelt them. And they use this term, they turned the world upside down. With the gospel. That is phenomenal. So he gives us boldness. He comforts us. The Holy Spirit comforts us when things happen in our lives. When tragedy comes. When heartache comes. When families are torn apart. When you lose everything. The Holy Spirit comforts us and says, Listen, it is okay. He does that. The Holy Spirit comforts the church when persecution comes against them. We see this again in the book of Acts and throughout Scripture where the world came against the church and they, it, looked, it appeared as if they were losing everything. But the Holy Spirit indwelt them and comforted them and kept them focused on our Lord. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. And we need that so desperately in our day in America where there's so much secularism and they try to, try to argue and they try to say that we're, we're not intellectual and we're not gifted and we're not smart and that kind of thing. But the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom to deal with that properly and in the midst of it point people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit teaches us when we open the Word of God if you don't know the Lord today, the Bible doesn't mean a lot to you. It just doesn't. You'll open it and it's as if you're reading bark on a pine tree. It doesn't make sense to you. But when the Holy Spirit comes in and it dwells us, you look at it and you go, yes, I get it. I understand. Praise God. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit warns us of so many things. Warns us of heretical things, a false doctrine. It warns us of, of things that we need to be careful of. The Holy Spirit gives us passion. Passion is a little different from boldness. They're cousins for sure, but He gives us passion. I want to see Hampstead to be a passionate church for the gospel. That that's what we live for. Yes, we go fishing. Yes, we play golf. Yes, we, we like basketball. Yes, by the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't lead us to like Duke basketball. <laughs> In case you were wondering that. We have passion for a lot of things. But the Holy Spirit gives us a passion for Jesus. Amen. By the way, if you're in a church and all they ever talk about is the Holy Spirit and Jesus is back here, that's warped. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. He always does. That is His job. And He gives us a passion for our Lord. The Holy Spirit guides us in everything we do. If you're in the decision-making process right now, you'd best be on your knees and pray, Lord, guide me through this. Lord, if this is not where I'm to be or not what I'm supposed to be doing, then please give me an unsettledness about this. And He does that in our lives. So this is how this small band of believers turned the world upside down through the power of the Holy Spirit so we can rest in the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Hampstead Baptist Church can be united in Christ. We may not do everything perfectly. I understand that. And if we did, it'd freak me out. <laughs> I'm sure not going to do everything perfectly. But we can be united in the Holy Spirit and get the gospel to the world. Jesus promises Holy Spirit and He follows through with that promise. But then, and I love this, folks, and we see it here Jesus said, I'm going now, guys, fellas, I'm, I'm leaving right now, but I'm sending my Holy Spirit. That's His promise. And then He says, I 
will return. Amen. Listen, the timing of Jesus, the timing of our Lord is perfect, isn't it? In every way. We said that last week out of the text. And by the way, as I was reading, as I was preaching last week, and I, or the week before or whenever that was, and I ran across that. His timing is perfect. It almost literally overwhelmed me. It truly is. His timing is perfect. And we see that. His timing for His departure was perfect. Therefore, His timing for His return is perfect. He's coming back, folks. Amen. He's coming back. And I know at times it looks rough. It looks almost hopeless. But He's coming back. In the meantime, He's given us His Holy Spirit, not only to set and wait, but to take the gospel to the world, knowing that He's coming back. Now, I don't know what His, his return is going to look like exactly. We're given some idea. But I know this, He's coming back. Amen. Keep that in mind, church. He's coming back. Submit to the power of the Holy Spirit every moment of your life. Get the gospel to the world knowing that the time is short and Jesus is coming back. Amen. And you may be, again, in the midst of misery, but you won't be for long because He's coming back. He promised His return. His timing was perfect. His return would be perfect. The timing there. His ascension was glorious. As we see in Scripture, His return will be glorious. And as you've heard it said so many times, He'll not be riding a little donkey when He comes back next time, folks. He will be absolute conqueror in every way. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. That's His return. It'll be glorious. His ascension was about Himself. His return will be about Himself. It'll not be about me. And it'll not be about you. Now we get great benefit from it. Unspeakable benefit. But it's about the Lord Jesus. As John the Baptist says, He must increase. I must decrease. And then His ascension, the promise of His ascension gives us hope. His return gives us amazing hope. Amen. Folks, if I didn't know, if I wasn't convinced that Jesus was coming back to take us from this wretched place, I don't know that I could function, honestly. But I can continue to go through the power of His Holy Spirit and knowing that He's coming back. That before we can even fathom, we will be in His presence. That's a promise. That's why we can do what we do. So, the promise, we can rest in His promises. But secondly and quickly, we can trust in the promise of Jesus. So we can rest in knowing the re His Holy Spirit, His promise of His Holy Spirit, and in His return. We can rest in all those things, but we can also trust in those things as well. And in verses 12 through 14, we see a different group of people, don't we? Immediately, we see a different group of people. The Holy Spirit hadn't descended upon them yet, and we'll see that soon in the book. But they were resting now in the promises of a risen Lord. Things began to be different. They were resting and now they were trusting in those promises. They were different now. Remember, these men scattered. Remember when they came against Jesus and arrested Him? You could hardly find the disciples, could you? They were gone. Hold, I don't know this guy, not me. And they cowered it down. But now... They, things, the puzzle was being put together for them. And they began to understand. They began to see. And they began to rest. And they began to trust. They were scattered, but now they were, the text says, with one accord. Amen. This is what the promises of Jesus, that's what they do for us. And folks, when a church is scattered, they are weak. They are powerless. They're afraid. They have no impact to the world. But when the church is in one accord, world, look out. Amen. Because when a church is on the same page, 
the Jesus page, they can change the world. Amen. Absolutely, folks. Listen, we're no different than these guys, are we? Without Jesus, without His promises, without the Holy Spirit, we're just as scattered. But with Jesus, in His promises, with the power of the Holy Spirit, in one accord, this community can be changed for the glory of God. Amen. It can, folks. So we see two things there. When they started trusting in the promises of Jesus, resting in those promises and trusting in those promises, we see two things. They were in one accord, they were in prayer. Amen. One accord, prayer. They were united and they were in prayer. Together in the gospel, praying in the gospel. Together and praying. That's what we are to be about. That's why you've heard me say over and over, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Look, folks, we'll have disagreements. We will. Uh, again, if we didn't, it would kind of freak me out. I, it wouldn't make sense to me because we have different philosophies, different ideas at times. You know, we're put together differently. And, but that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Amen. It really is. It's, it's a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's in how we handle it. So we can have all these varieties, all these different ideas, but when we're focused on Jesus, somehow He brings all of that together and makes this incredible unified body. And it is a picture of the Godhead. It's a picture of Jesus. Amen. And when that happens, just phenomenal things happen. You know, I, I, I get weary of a tired, dead church. Not, not here, I mean the church. It doesn't make sense to me that, that churches are not doing anything and that they're not bold and that they're not, God's not using them to change the world because we can. We can through Christ. Y'all are looking at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> but we can. They did. And we'll see this over and over. They did. And we can too. Amen. Through Jesus. So that is what we are to be about. Let's go get them. <laughs> amen. And I'm glad God sent me an amen corner over here. <laughs> We're going to have our time of invitation now. And man, there's so much to do. My, my first challenge is, if you don't know this Lord, this Jesus that we've pointed to today, if you don't know, if you never trusted in Him, you, you need to. Because you are lost outside of Christ. You are a sinner by nature. We all were. We cannot save ourselves. We can do nothing in and of ourselves to have a relationship with God. Nothing. Jesus did it all. Place your trust in Him. And we can help you with that today. And I invite you to respond to that.